All right. Well, welcome to Sedaris. My name is Dave, one of the pastors here. Uh, very excited for this evening. Excited that you're here. If you're new, thank you for uh, visiting. We hope that uh, this is a, uh, an enjoyable time. We hope that you learned something. We hope that you're glad that you came. So we'd love to meet you, so don't hesitate to come say hello to me after the service. Uh, it's a small and growing community, but not big enough yet that I can't know everybody's name. So I like to know everyone's name. So glad that you're here. All right, so we are in a series Brand new series. So you've come at a perfect time uh, to kick off the fall. We're starting a series in the gospel according to Mark. And if you were with us last week, Ryan and I, uh, the other pastor here, uh, we kind of tag teamed an introduction to the gospel according to Mark. And so now we, we are really beginning right in the first verse, and we're going to walk through it from now until Easter. It's going to be great. Perfect timing. We're very excited. And I can't take credit for that. I have to give credit to Ryan for that perfect timing, okay? So, um, if you've got a Bible, would you grab it and open with me to the Gospel of Mark? And then here's, here's one of my hopes for tonight. That if you've ever been a bridesmaid or a groomsman, a best man or a maid of honor, um, I hope that tonight that we will redeem that experience for you, <laughs> okay? Now, if you've been, you're laughing, because sometimes it's not always pleasant. Uh, sometimes it can be outright nasty, and you could have a lingering taste in your mouth that's not so great. So here, here's, here's my big goal, it's, you know, not my only goal, but big goal. Redeem that experience, because I want to show you that God might be using that experience to actually teach you something about the gospel, to teach you something about discipleship, about following Jesus, about what your place in the world is. Maybe he's using that experience, particularly if it was a hard experience, uh, as a sort of test for you to see actually what the life lived in God's story looks like, okay? Because what we're going to see tonight is a story about a man uh, who became known as John the Baptist or John the Baptizer. Uh, and he became known like that because he was in the business of dunking people in water, baptizing people. And, and John the Baptizer, he was the ultimate groomsman, the ultimate best man. He did it right. He learned something from John. And what we're going to see is the greatest moment of John's life the greatest moment of his life uh, is actually a moment in which he doesn't get the glory. It's, it's a moment in which he's not the centerpiece. He's not the star of the show. The way John processes this moment is not by saying, you know, I better get my money's worth at this open bar. And, you know, John didn't say, well, uh, maybe if I could catch the garter, and I'll be the next to be married. Then this will be a great day. And he didn't say, you know what, I need to crush it on the dance floor so that the next morning uh, the groom's grandmother recognizes my dance moves and gives me a shout out at the going away brunch. John didn't need any of those things. Now those are actually all real ways in which I have been a groomsman in my life. <laughs> okay? Those are real stories. I'll tell you later more in detail. Each of those stories is a true story. And they're examples of how I tried to manufacture value for myself because maybe I didn't fully see how great it was to get to stand next to the centerpiece. For John the Baptist, to be next to Jesus at this truly holy moment, at Jesus' baptism, that, that was more than enough. That, that was the joy of his life. That was the greatest moment of his life. I need to tell you that. So we're going we're to take a look and see how can this be? What can we learn from this John? So that's what we're going to do. Now, quickly, I want to recap a little bit of last week so that we can get to this one really big question because we're titling this series The Most Important Question Ever Asked. So 
Uh, what we said last week is, uh, this gospel according to Mark, Mark, whose full name is John Mark, uh, he was a traveling companion of the Apostle Peter. And Peter was one of the original 12 disciples, walk with Jesus, talk with Jesus, was in the intimate moments with Jesus, heard Jesus explain what he really meant when he said certain things. And so uh, when we come to the New Testament documents, the reason why we trust them so much is because they have a tie to an apostle. Okay? And Peter was really sort of the star of the New Testament church. He was the rock. Jesus said, you'll be the rock that I'll build my church on. And he, and he was. And so John Mark is coming to write his gospel basically by hearing the stories, hearing the sermons preached by Peter, talking to Peter, hearing his account of what life with Jesus was like, the things that Jesus said, the things that Jesus did. And now he is memorializing those stories and sermons and theological ideas for us in what we call one of the gospels. And it's written probably because the apostles were starting to get old. And so what we want to always ask ourselves when we come, even now today, is, is what's being said, is what I'm going to say, is what I'm reading in a book or I'm hearing on a podcast, whatever it is, is this something that the apostles themselves taught? Because that's how you know it's trustworthy. And the reason that we know that John Mark is a trustworthy document that we can trust him is because he is basically writing the memoirs of Peter the Apostle. So we can trust him because we want to get back to that original connection with Jesus. And Peter had that. And the context for this writing is, is probably written to a group in Rome. A group of Christians who had been persecuted, who were fearing for their life every single day because they called themselves Christians. There's an urgency we talked about to this gospel. An urgency, 42 times this word immediately comes up. We'll see it twice today. There's this idea that Jesus came to accomplish a mission. He didn't come to figure something out. He came to accomplish a mission. And so there's this urgency, there's this pace to the gospel according to Mark, because Jesus is mission-oriented. He, he's coming to accomplish something, and as we'll see, what he's coming to do is to die and to rise again. And so there's this, there's this urgency, but there's also this motif of suffering. The, the, to, to be the Messiah, to be following the Messiah, is to engage in a life that includes suffering. It's unavoidable. It's actually part of the mission and so we talked about suffering and how, and we'll see that come up again and again. We also talked about this gospel will show us what it means to be a disciple. And, and, and one of the great things about Mark is that we'll find out that you don't have to be perfect. In fact, the picture that we have of the disciples in the gospel according to Mark uh, is not perfection. It's, it's not they're the most knowledgeable. It's actually, they're quite, they're, they're quite ignorant. They're, they're a little dumb. They're slow on the uptake, but they're very courageous, and they choose to continue to follow this Jesus who looked different than, than the Messiah that they thought, but they trusted him. They saw, they recognized something in him, his power, his sentness, and they followed him. So you don't have to be perfect to be a disciple, but you have to trust and follow Jesus. And then we said, throughout all of this gospel, there's this one big question that's just hanging on the edge, wanting to be answered, begging us to engage in it. And we've said it's the most important question that's ever been asked in the history of the world. And, it, and it's this question, and Jesus asks it himself right in the middle of the gospel. He says, who do you say that I am? So that's the question that we'll be asking until Easter. Who do you say Jesus is? Who do you say Jesus is? And that word say is important. We'll see tonight that every time this question is answered correctly, every time someone says Jesus is the Christ, Jesus is the Son of God, every time that happens, a holy moment is birthed. A holy moment happens. I want to show you why that is tonight. I'm so if you can't tell. I'm so excited about tonight and this gospel. The Word of God is powerful. Let me say that again. 
The Word of God is the most powerful thing in this universe. The Word of God. We'll see that tonight. So, let's read the passage all the way through. Here we go. The beginning of the Gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As it is written in Isaiah the prophet, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying out in the wilderness says, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. And then John appeared, baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sin. And all the country of Judea and all Jerusalem were going out to John, and they were being baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair and wore a leather belt around his waist. And he ate locusts and wild honey. And he preached, saying, After me comes he who is mightier than I, the strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee all the way down to visit John. And he was baptized by John in the Jordan River. And when he came up out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens being opened up And the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven. You are my beloved Son. With you I am well pleased. Now, how many of you know what a trope is? Let me just see. Any film buffs? I got my man DJ over here. Okay. You guys know that I love uh, film, storytelling, and a trope... um, Here's basically what it is. It's a recurring theme or motif, a way of telling a story that you see kind of over and over and over again. And there's this one type of, of, of storytelling trope that, that is called how we got here. Or I like to call it up to speed. Okay? And there's this whole category, and, and you could sort of put different films or TV shows or, or books into this, into this category, into this trope. And this how we got here trope goes something like this. I'm going to show you right at the beginning the ending. And you're not going to be sure why I'm showing you the ending at the beginning until you get to the ending. And then it makes sense of the beginning. You seen a movie like this? Uh, Matrix fans. Matrix Reloaded. Trinity falling out of an office tower window. Serious? I'm not that old. That's a great, that is a great trope, okay? Uh, Now, why is she falling in slow motion out of an office tower? Well, you got to watch the rest of the movie to figure it out. Forrest Gump's a version of this. This is the lightest, (laughs) this shows the kind of movies I watch. This is the lightest option I could think of. Uh, Sitting on a bench to start the movie. And then he begins to recall his life story of how he got to sitting on that bench. Fight Club? Not so light. (laughs) But Tyler Durden holding a gun in the mouth of the narrator to start the movie. Okay. (laughs) Got to watch the movie to figure out what's going on. Okay, well, as I studied this text today, the very beginning of Mark, actually what, what I found was that In a certain sense, I think Mark, John Mark, is using a variation of this trope to draw us into the story that we might continue to read to figure out why is it that this first scene happens. Now, now it's not the same in that it's not a future scene that's just brought to to the beginning. But it is the same in that the answer to this big question gets answered right at the beginning of Mark's gospel, but yet the entire gospel is trying to answer that question. But it's already been answered. Now we can kind of know where it's going, but imagine if you didn't know the whole story. Right here at the beginning of the story, it's actually God himself that answers the question of the gospel of Mark. Who is this Jesus? And what we'll see is that God declares, God's word pronounces, this is my son. 
Now, why did Mark give the answer to this huge question right at the beginning? Why did he give it to us right at the beginning and then try to convince us, try to show us why this conclusion should be our conclusion? And I think the reason that he's done this is because this form that the gospel takes, this, this literary structure that it takes, I think actually mimics the structure of faith itself and how faith works. Let me try to explain that. The, the truth is always this, that God speaks and it's final. Here's some examples. In the beginning, God spoke creation into existence and He spoke saying, it is good. Now it is good, but we've marred it up. We've tainted it. But you know what? It never makes God's words false. In fact, those words are always true, even in the process of Him redeeming its goodness. So we can look at the world and we can say, it doesn't look so good all the time. The earthquakes, the hurricane, the natural disaster, it doesn't look so good, but it is good because God said it is good. And one day we'll look back and we'll see, yeah, it always was good. And he patiently waited to redeem it back to its original spoken goodness. We see it right after the fall in Genesis where God speaks to Adam, to Eve, and this serpent who has tricked the two, tempted them into disobeying God, and he speaks truth. He tells that serpent, I will crush your head by the offspring of the woman. Yes, you'll bruise his heel, but I will crush his head. In that moment, the victory was spoken by God against evil, sin, death, and that serpent. And yet God patiently waits to unwrap and unveil in time, space, history, the realization of that victory. But it's done. It's been spoken by God. We also see in the Old Testament, God speaks covenants to humanity. He makes promises to them. And once He's made a promise, it is true. It is real. It does not change. No matter how much we as human beings live into that same covenant. So He makes covenants. He speaks covenants with Noah, with Abraham, Isaac, David. And from God's point of view, these are finished, final, settled realities. Promises that He's made. Yet, we as human beings have the freedom to muddle our way towards keeping our side of the covenant. But it doesn't change the fact that those covenants are true, real, and eternal. They will not change. God has spoken them. Now, here at the beginning of Mark, we see an example of how this works. Because right at the beginning of Mark, what we will see is that God has spoken promises, predictions, prophecies of what will happen, how He'll redeem the world, that He'll send a Messiah, and before the Messiah, He will send a messenger to prepare the way of the Lord. So, so here's an example of it. So I just, let me read it to you real quickly. So if you're there with me in Mark, let's read the first three verses. The beginning of the Gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As it is written in Isaiah the prophet, quote, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying out in the wilderness says this, Prepare the way of the Lord, make His paths straight. Now, what you'll notice if you were to turn to Isaiah, is that actually what Mark is doing here is he's quoting from three Old Testament prophecies. He's quoting from Isaiah 40, 2-3. He's quoting from Exodus 23-20. And Malachi 3, 1, and and, in a sense, 4-5. And so what he's saying here at the very beginning of Mark is he's saying that the beginning of the good news is actually the fulfillment of this word spoken by God long ago that, that God has patiently waited to bring to fulfillment. 
In fact, he's waited four centuries before sending this next real prophet. I'll just turn, turn real quickly. And what's so interesting about this quotation from Malachi is that Malachi is the very last prophetic book before you hit the Gospels. And let me just read for you from Malachi 3.1. It says this, Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. And the Lord, whom you seek, will suddenly come to his temple, and the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight. Behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. And then the very last verse in the Old Testament says this, Behold, I will send you Elijah, the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord. And he will turn the hearts of fathers to their children and hearts of children to their fathers. And then guess what happens? Mark, who we said last week is the first gospel written, starts his gospel by quoting from Malachi. See see what's happening here? Here is an example of God has spoken true words and then patiently waited to fulfill those words in human history. So this is always the pattern with God. He speaks something true, then He waits to fulfill it. He waits to fulfill that truth in both human history and in human hearts. And this waiting is done always because of human stubbornness interacting with God's loving kindness. This, this is the pattern. And, and that's important. Let me, let me say that again. That's so important to understand. So why does God wait? It's not just because He's slow to act. It's because he loves us. So he's patient with us. He knows that we're stubborn. He knows that we're slow of hearing. He knows that we don't quite get the joke. And so he waits. Some examples of this human stubbornness that I thought of when I think of myself are, as I said, somebody tells a great joke. And then about four minutes later, I I figured out. And I laugh. (laughs) Well, the joke was made four minutes ago, even though I didn't realize how funny it was until now. You see how that works? It's it's been made. The funniness has entered the world. Just because I didn't recognize it for four minutes doesn't mean that that it hadn't already happened. Uh, Back in my day, back when The Matrix was a great movie, um, you register online for classes. I went to the University of Washington, and you know the internet wasn't quite so fast as it is now. Hard to believe. And so what you do is, is registration was open at 6 a.m. Now you had your buddies that you wanted to, to, to take classes with, so you had two things going. You're on, you're on your really old bad connection cell phone, and you're on your computer right at 6 a.m., and then it opens up, and you just start clicking. You just start clicking your classes. You know what I'm talking about? You click, you click, and your buddy's on the other side. He's like, hey, did you get that class? Did you get that class? And you're like, well, I got the class because I clicked. (laughs) But I don't know if UW has realized that I got that class because it's not (laughs) refreshing (laughs) fast enough. And so there's this funny dialogue that's happening. Well, did you register? It's like, well, yeah, I registered, but I didn't really register because the other side of the equation hasn't responded. See that? I mean, it's happened. I've clicked. Like 400 times, I've already clicked that class. But UW still hasn't realized that I'm taking that class with my buddy Gary. <laughs> I wish I had a buddy Gary. I, don't, I did not have a buddy named Gary. <laughs> I've always, always wanted one. Okay. This, this another example. Just, I just want to drill this home. Uh, in 2009... Just, just like a month after I met my wife, Allie, I knew I was going to marry Allie. In fact, it was a done deal. Well, Allie didn't realize that until 2011, right? But it was set in stone. It was going to happen. I, I, it was, it, I pretty much married her in 2009. She didn't realize it until 2011. Doesn't mean it didn't happen. It just means she didn't realize it, Okay. Now, on a more serious note, Jesus died for my sin in 30 A.D., but I didn't realize it until about 1995. See that? 
This is the pattern that Mark highlights for us in the way he's written his gospel. Let me express it again for us in, in the most straightforward way that I can. God speaks at the beginning of Mark. This man right here, this Jesus of Nazareth, he is my son. And in fact, he's been my son before the foundation of the world because he existed with me. I know my son, and that's him. And then he waits. And we see again and again throughout the Gospel of Mark, he patiently waits for his disciples, the Jews, the Gentiles, the Roman soldiers. He waits for them to realize it by continually showing himself to be the Son of God. Because that's how it always works. That's how God operates. Because humans are thick skulled, slow on the uptake, and we lack faith in the Word of God. But God knows this, and in His loving kindness, He just keeps clicking download, 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 hoping that if He asks us the question enough times, if we ask the question of no, enough times, that eventually we'll get the right answer. Mark's gospel is beautiful in this way. It asks and it helps answer the most important question in all of human history. Who is this Jesus? Now, if you're not yet a Christian, we're so, we're so glad that you're here. I hope, we're so glad you're here. This is so exciting for me. The, if you're not yet a Christian, just know that if you're asking this question but you don't have the answer yet, God knows that. He's not caught off guard by that. He understands that and he welcomes you in to ask the question again. Just keep asking. This is, this is, he knows this. He's patient. His loving kindness. He says, I'm waiting for you. This is how he's always worked. But it doesn't mean that it's not true even if we don't realize it yet. Because God spoke it. Now, on a, on, a, on a very personal note, let me explain to you why this of all questions is the most important. Because I believe it's the most personal of all the questions that we get to try to answer about God. When Grayson was born, that's my son, he's, he's a little over two now, uh, it was so funny uh, because... He came out of the womb. It was a long labor. It took a while. And he's a stubborn boy. And he came out, and the first thing we noticed is he had red hair. Well, I, I was like, where'd that come from? <laughs> <laughs> and then the next thing I noticed is he has these big, nice, full lips. Well, God didn't bless me in that way. And really, he didn't bless Allie in that way. I'm like, okay, you know, I, I had the moment in my head where I'm like, uh, you know, is this my child? <laughs> and then I look down at his feet. And if, if you know me, if you've ever seen me in flip-flops, my, my pinky toe folds over my other toe. And it's quite awkward. <laughs> I don't realize how awkward it is because it's, you know, I only know it one way. And most people are grossed out by it. But it's me, and I look down at Grayson's feet, and guess what? His pinky toe is folded over. And I'm not joking you. This is, a, this is true. I yelled out in the middle of that room, It's my son! <laughs> <laughs> and everyone's looking at me like, Yes, it's your son. That's why you're here. Like, <laughs> thought we were clear on that. And it was this moment where, you know, it was so amazing when I, This is my son. And every time somebody else mimics those words that I first spoke, when they see Grayson running around and they look at him and, and maybe they see a little bit of me in him or something and they go, hey, that's your son, isn't it? I mean, I fill up with joy. I, I can't explain it. It's just a thing that happens. Every time someone says, uh, is this your boy? I mean, I just start sweating because I'm so excited. It's happening right now. <laughs> I think it's the same thing with God. 
He knows that Jesus is his son. But every time someone else says it, it brings him joy. It brings him joy. So, let's read the passage all the way through, and then I've got a few more comments. Here we go. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, As it is written in Isaiah the prophet, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying out in the wilderness says, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. And then John appeared, baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sin. And all the country of Judea and all Jerusalem were going out to John. And they were being baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair and wore a leather belt around his waist. And he ate locusts and wild honey. And he preached, saying, After me comes he who is mightier than I, the strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee all the way down to visit John. And he was baptized by John in the Jordan River. And when he came up out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens being opened up and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my beloved Son. With you I am well pleased. This was a holy moment where Jesus Christ was recognized by God the Father, for who He was. And if we can experience a holy moment by also recognizing Jesus for who He is, for correctly answering the question, who do you say that Jesus is? Then we need to ask ourselves a question. How do we get there a little bit faster? (laughs) Okay? This is assuming that you want to experience a holy moment, okay? Maybe you don't, and that's okay too. But if this is true, I want to show you two ways which I think Mark's recollection of John the Baptist and his ministry will actually help us to do this, will actually help us get to this moment a little bit faster and a little bit more often. Now look at this. What What did we just see that John came doing? He came baptizing. And where did he baptize? in the wilderness, in the Jordan River, which, which is a ways outside of the main city, which is Jerusalem, uh, in, in between, probably in the south side uh, of the Jordan wi- River. Um, Jesus was up in the Sea of Galilee in the north, so it's quite some distance for Jesus to come visit John. That's, that's sort of important to understand uh, the story as well. Jesus recognized who John was, as well as John recognizing who Jesus was. But John's in the wilderness, and he's baptizing. And he's telling people to confess their sins. Him doing this is, yes, as I've already said, a fulfillment of a prophecy that one would come before the Messiah to prepare his way. That's John. So so in one sense, that's what's important. But it's also important the work that that John is actually doing. And and here's what I mean by that. Um, Yes, he's fulfilling prophecy, but God doesn't just do things to do things. He always has a reason. God's never in it for the spectacle, okay? So there's something very valuable about what John is doing. Like what he is doing is actually preparing the way of the Lord. It's making straight paths so that when Jesus comes, he might fulfill what he's come to do, both in history and in the hearts of the people. So baptism by water, the confessing of sins, And preparing people's hearts for the coming of Jesus is what it means to make straight the paths of the Lord. And John's trying to do this for both the nation of Israel and for each individual person. So it's going to actually tell us something important about how do we come to an answer to this most important question. So the first way to prepare ourselves for this holy moment is this. This is how you make straight paths for the Lord in your life. You almost always need to go out into the wilderness. Some of you are like, yes, I've been doing that for years. This is my first time back in church. Well, (laughs) that's not exactly what I'm saying. 
But the geography matters here. There's a reason why John wasn't in in the city baptizing. There's a reason why Jesus begins his ministry in the wilderness. And, And here's why the wilderness is important. It's simple. It's uncluttered. It, it, it's getting rid of all the things that distract us. So to go out into the wilderness requires you to leave a lot of stuff behind, to leave your junk at home, to, to streamline your life. That's, that's why camping ministries are so powerful if you've ever been a part of one of those. It's not just that it's a beautiful place, though, though that, there's some truth in that. It's, it's that when you go to these places, you're leaving behind all the junk. Like, like when we take kids up to camp, you got to get rid of the cell phone. Or adults, get rid of the cell phones. Put them, in, put them in a container, we'll give them to you when the week's over. You, you're getting away from your busy schedule. You're, you're leaving your stuff behind. And only then, when you declutter your life, when you simplify, do you, do you create the room to ask the right questions, the, the big questions, to really start to consider the important things of life. Now, in, in, a, in a similar way, he says, they came to him to be baptized in water and to confess their sins. Confession and repentance, which is symbolized by water baptism, this idea of cleansing. And John was doing this. This is different than the baptism that Jesus inaugurated when he was baptized, which is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. This is truly like a, like a ritualistic cleansing of sin. It's symbolizing that you have confessed and you're repenting from the sin in your life. This is another way to strip away the baggage that keeps you from asking and answering life's most important questions. Because if you are living in your sin, if you're living in patterns and lifestyles and ways that become heavy, it, it, unless you cleanse yourself of that, it's going to be very hard to ask the important questions. This is what John was doing. He was making straight paths by helping people to confess and repent and turn from the ways that were cluttering their life, their mind, their heart. And, and also, we see this in the New Testament. Uh, the writers, the apostles will talk about what we need to do as people, as vessels for the Holy Spirit, is we must first cleanse the vessel the temple, so that the Holy Spirit might come and indwell. Now this doesn't mean, uh, this, this is important, this doesn't mean that you shape up your life in order to become a Christian. Because what, what the gospel will teach us is that the way to true cleansing is through the death and resurrection of Jesus. So you come as you are, but you confess and repent, and, and then Jesus takes away the sin. So it doesn't mean shape up and I need to start acting like a Christian before I can come to these questions. You start asking these questions, but you, you come with, with a mindset and a mentality that, you know what, I'm probably going to have to let some things go if I'm really going to ask these questions. Now, now, if you're a thinking person, you might be asking, well, well, if Jesus had John baptize him and John was baptizing uh, for, for the forgiveness of sin, does that mean Jesus needed forgiveness of sin? And the answer is No. He lived the perfect sinless life, which made him the perfect sacrifice. But the reason that Jesus comes to John and has him baptized is because he's inaugurating a new kind of baptism. The kind of baptism here that John mentions, that there's one coming who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. And in Jesus, we see the first instance of that kind of baptism. And so I think Jesus did this for for that reason, to inaugurate that I'm coming to do a new kind of baptism, a new kind of work. And also as a way of saying, I want to participate in what I'm going to call the rest of my followers to participate in, which is water baptism. And so we, if you've been baptized, have done what Jesus did. So he comes, we're preparing the way of the Lord by stripping away, decluttering, cleansing ourselves. And, And here's what you need to know from this. It takes intentionality to do this, because we're called to do this today, to prepare a way for the Lord to come to our lives. And we do that by being intentional. This might look like changing your physical location. It might look like examining your lifestyles and habits and changing those. So you have to be intentional. It doesn't just happen to you. You have to do something. If you really want to ask this most important question, you have to be intentional and change something. And then you have to get honest. 
You have to get honest that whatever you've been doing before isn't working. All the stuff, all the clutter, all the busyness, all the variety, all the distraction, it's not actually filling you up in the way that you know that it should. You feel that, right? You know that it's not working. And you've got to get honest with yourself. So maybe you've been looking for the wrong thing. Maybe you need to start looking for new answers. Maybe you need to start asking new questions. Maybe you need to start finding something new to fill yourself up. Because if you're honest, whatever it is you're trying is not working. And when you feel that, I ask you this question. Have you considered Jesus? Have you considered filling up your life with Him? So I want to I caution you here. Because an emptying without a right filling is futile. In fact, it, it's dangerous. So, so if you say, well, I need to, you know, and this could be true for you, I need to break up from whoever I'm dating. I need to move. I need a new job. I need to start over. That might actually be, be needed, but if you do those things and you don't fill it with the right thing, you're either going to fall into the exact same habit in your new city or your new job or your new relationship, or something worse is going to fill that place. If you don't start asking the right questions and really consider, maybe I need to fill this with something new, something that might actually fill me up. So that's the first key to how, how do you actually prepare for this holy moment. Uh, the second thing is you need to see yourself properly. When we look at the life of John the Baptist, he becomes the perfect example of this. Now listen, listen to the story. Who was going out to see John? Who was making a long, hard journey to see John? Now there's some hyperbole going on here, but it's all of Judea and all of Jerusalem. Can you imagine how that could fill you up with pride? That people, a lot of people are coming out to see me. They're calling me a prophet. And yet, John didn't start his own movement. John was very, very happy to fill his role in Jesus' story. In fact, the only words that we have recorded for us from John the Baptist by Mark are these words. After me is coming he who is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. And the person that would come and untie your sandals was most likely the slave in your household. John's saying, I'm not even worthy to be Jesus' slave and wash his feet. That's who I am compared to Jesus. In another gospel, we see John, in another instance, another scenario in which he and Jesus are in the same place, telling his disciples, I must decrease so that he can increase. This is the picture of, of what it means to start to prepare your heart to really ask the most important question ever. And you know, you know what happens? Jesus actually calls John the greatest prophet who ever lived. Not because he was full of himself, but because he saw himself properly and he knew how small he was. He was nothing, except that he was invited into Jesus' story. And John got that. And he was very excited and very happy to take on that place in history. Until we learn to be nothing, we can never become something. If we insist on adding Jesus to our story, we will have no story at all. We must accept his invitation, the invitation from God, to be included in Jesus' story. That's how we gain a story. Jesus says this himself. He says, whoever wants to find their life must lose it. Or you could say it this way. Whoever wants to find their story must lose their story. That's the amazing thing about John the Baptist. His entire life's work culminates, climaxes, crescendos in this one holy moment where he is not the one getting fame and glory but it's Jesus. He, he's not the star of his greatest moment. It's this other guy. And by his intentional, honest, faithful recognition of who he was in Jesus' story, John the Baptist gets to stand 
side by side with the Son of God at his royal coronation. What a great privilege. What a great honor. Are you willing to let the greatest moment of your life be the moment in which you make the most of Jesus? When you look back on your life, are you okay if the greatest moment of your life is the moment in which you made the most of Jesus of Nazareth? Are you excited about getting to stand next to the star of the show? If you, if you can see yourself properly, accept your smallness, then you're ready to ask the most important question ever asked. So maybe you just need to ask it again. Ask it well. God will be faithful, and he will help you to answer it well, but, but you've got to start to see yourself properly. You're, you're not the star of the show. And if you do that, you too will experience what Jesus experienced right, right here. We see the account of it. A holy moment. A holy moment. And just like Jesus, when you hear the words coming out of your mouth, Jesus Christ is the Son of God, you too will feel the Spirit of God descend upon you and fill you with His presence. You can talk to people again and again and again who have answered the question from the depths of their heart truly and rightly and they've experienced this their holy moment now one one final one final thought here when we ask the question as many times as it takes and we honestly and intentionally prepare our hearts and our minds to come to the question with fairness and in and, and a sense of of i truly want to know when we do that and we answer correctly, and we experience what Jesus experienced, this holy moment where we experience the Spirit of God coming upon us. That's not the only time that happens. That can happen for you over and over again. Now, it's never like the first time, but over and over again, you can have holy moments where the truth of what God spoke at this occasion, this is my Son, where that becomes realer for you, where that, that, that has, becomes textured for you, where it stirs you in a new way, that, that you, in a, in a real sense, have more of these moments. And I know this because I've experienced it over and over and over. I had it this week. <laughs> I said, just thought about this. I had this, these holy moments. And, and, and the other thing is, we also get to live in spaces where these holy moments are happening. And, and what's so interesting about this account, Mark's account, is that, look, look at the language again. It says, and a voice came from heaven as Jesus is coming up out of the water. I want you, I want you to picture yourself being there, okay? Because I'm sure lots and lots of people were there. And, and look how Mark tells it. A voice came from heaven, you are my beloved son, with you I am well pleased. Now here's what's interesting, and we don't really know the answer to this question. Did John hear that voice? Did the people around hear that voice? I don't think Mark wants us to think that way, which is why he says you are. And here's what's so interesting. Regardless of whether or not you know a holy moment is happening, that you get to be in the room that you get to be in the river, that you get to be on the river banks while this moment is happening is so incredible. I've had this experience in, in many ways, that not only have I got to experience holy moments, but I get to be in the room when holy moments happen. Sometimes I have no idea that they've happened until much later down the road and somebody tells me, hey, did you know that on that day, in that conversation, I came to know that Jesus Christ was the Son of God. And I'd be like, oh my gosh, I had no idea. I literally was blind to the fact. But then I look back and I say, oh my gosh, I was there for that. Praise God that he allowed me to be in there. Then there's other times where I didn't hear them say the words, Jesus Christ is the Son of God, but I sensed that something eternal had just happened. Have you, have you had this experience where you're like, uh, something just happened? And it was something like a dove <laughs> that came down because there was, there was something that just happened in this moment. I experienced a shift. I didn't hear the words said, but I experienced a shift. I've been a part of that. 
Praise be to God. I can't believe he's invited me into that moment. That's part of the glory of being a part of God's story. And then there's been other times when I've got to actually walk somebody through saying those words for the first time, that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And those are great privileges. It's a great honor. And each one is special in its own way. And I could tell you stories about this, but I don't have time. But every time, I knew this to be true. I was there, but I had nothing to do with it. I just got invited in to be a part of it as a spectator. God let me, because he loves me. He let me sit there in that room. He let me be in that conversation. He let me view from afar this holy moment. Whether I was in the water with him, whether I was on the riverbank, he let me be a part of that holy moment. And when that happens, I should just thank God. And, and if, if that's happened to you, and you haven't thanked God for letting, him be, for letting you be a part of it, just thank Him right now. Th- this is why we enter into the mission of God. Because He's invited us in, and He says, you know what? It's not about you. You don't save anyone. I do all the work. But you know what? I love you, and I want you to come with me. I I want you to be able to experience the joy that I experience. Because I'm your father. So if you're already a Christian, pray, expect that God is moving and working, and people are coming to the realization that he is the Son of God. And thank God when you get to be a part of that in some way. This is why we live on mission. And if you're not living on mission, you're missing out on the whole point of why God's left you on this earth. He's left you on the earth so you can experience those moments, either consciously or subconsciously. That's why you're here. So get on mission for him. Otherwise, what are you doing? What's the point? He's invited us into these holy moments. Now, if you're not yet a Christian, I hope you've heard something of, of, of this how did we get here trope. God has said, this is my son. Now walk with us through the rest of Mark as Mark realizes that you're not there yet. And he's going to show you all of the reasons that Jesus proved to be what God said that he was. Walk with us. Ask the questions. Keep asking. I promise you that the process of asking this question will be one of the great joys of your life. And God will be faithful If you ask, if you seek, I I believe that he will show you that this is his son. And then you'll realize it. And when you realize it, he'll give you the Holy Spirit. And your life will be changed forever. And you'll have your holy moment. But you gotta go one step at a time. And God knows that. And he encourages you and we encourage you. We celebrate that you're asking the questions. Would you pray with me? And then we will come uh, to the Lord's table. Father God, we thank you that when you speak, it is true. There is no wavering in your voice. There is no hesitation in your breath. That when you spoke at Jesus' baptism and said, this is my son, you didn't flinch. But that out of your loving kindness, you wait patiently for us to ask and to answer that question ourselves. And that you proved through the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus that that what you said at his baptism was true. God, may you give us eyes to see and ears to hear the truth of those words. May, May they penetrate our hearts through the stone, through the stubbornness. May may they truly move us and stir in us and that we really, when we think about Jesus, that we know that it's true. That He is your Son. That He is the Savior. And that there is no other way to the Father except through Him. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.